No. Well, good afternoon and thank you for coming because uh, as I just have delivered a statement in English in the Council, uh, I would like to give a brief summary in Spanish as well because there are some Spanish people speaking journalists, so before we're able to take two or three questions. La escarcelación de 62 detenidos a los pocos días de mi visita a Caracas, la liberación ayer de otros 22, entre ellos el periodista Braulio Jatar y la jueza Lourdes Afiuni, así como la aceptación de la presencia de dos oficiales de derechos humanos en el país, las entiendo como muestras de un nuevo compromiso de las autoridades venezolanas con la resolución de los múltiples desafíos en materia de derechos humanos que enfrenta el país. Tal y como demuestra nuestro informe, el Estado de Derecho y varias instituciones esenciales del país han sido erosionadas y el uso excesivo y letal de la fuerza se ha usado contra manifestantes y también en operaciones de seguridad por las FAES, las fuerzas especiales. La tortura es un grave problema, como trágicamente demostró la muerte del capitán Rafael Acosta Areola hace una semana. Y los venezolanos sufren ya desde hace varios años una crisis económica que afecta sus derechos fundamentales a la salud, a la alimentación, y las últimas sanciones impuestas sobre el país están exacerbando esta situación, dado que la mayoría de sus ingresos derivan de la exportación del petróleo. Entonces, al ser sancionado PDVSA y CITCO, sin duda que los afecta. Y yo tuve la ocasión eh, en, en Caracas de hablar con dos madres cuyos hijos necesitaban trasplante urgente, que financiaban PDVSA y que los bancos no permitieron liberar hacia las instituciones en Italia y en Argentina y esos niños no pudieron ser eh, operados. Yo espero entonces que las autoridades, así como tuvieron esta apertura para la oficina, para que nuestra visita permitiera tener todo tipo de encuentros con múltiples actores políticos y sociales, esperamos que las autoridades reciban las recomendaciones incluidas en el informe de la misma forma constructiva en la que fueron redactadas. Muchas gracias. Ok, sí, buenos días. Eh, en español para la agencia F. ¿Cuáles son los pasos concretos que cree debe seguir el, el gobierno de Maduro a la vista de sus recomendaciones eh, vertidas en este informe? ¿Y cómo cree que van a ser las relaciones entre su oficina y el gobierno después de la publicación de este? Gracias. Los pasos concretos. O sea, primero que nada, nosotros tenemos un acuerdo con el gobierno de Venezuela en áreas bien específicas y nosotros esperamos que esos acuerdos se vayan cumpliendo. Uno de ellos es, por supuesto, la presencia de los dos eh, oficiales de derechos humanos que están allá y que van a continuar allá y a los seis meses evaluar si se abre una oficina plena, de, completamente operativa, con más personal, que pueda cumplir el rol de manera más, eh, más importante de manera más, digamos, todos sus distintos mandatos. Lo segundo es eh, el, el, la presencia de, eh, digamos, de, de nuestros oficiales en que tengan acceso a las cárceles, un acceso amplio a las cárceles. En la primera visita en marzo, la misión que fue, pudo visitar varias cárceles, eh, pero en, eh, ahora nosotros estamos trabajando en un programa de trabajo, un cronograma de visita de cárceles, eh, para que nuestros colegas puedan ir ahí y poder conversar libremente con las personas que están detenidas y poder conocer su situación y sus condiciones. Unido a eso están dos acuerdos de cooperación técnica, que uno es analizar todas las dificultades y todos los obstáculos que existen en Venezuela para el acceso a la justicia, no solo, que no solo son para las personas privadas de libertad por razones políticas, sino para las personas privadas de libertad por cualquier razón. Y en ese sentido el gobierno lo tiene así de claro, por eso nos solicitó el apoyo para mirar cuáles son las razones y cuáles son las recomendaciones que pueden surgir de nosotros para eh, mejorar, por un lado, el acceso a la justicia y por otro lado, 
a, a también a mejorar condiciones en las prisiones. El gobierno venezolano, a lo que son las prisiones federales, ha hecho un esfuerzo por mejorar, pero hay mucha gente detenida en lo que se llama los centros de detención preventiva, que dependen de los municipios, que no dependen a nivel nacional y que están en muy malas condiciones, pero donde hay muchas, muchas personas detenidas. También es un área que nosotros queremos tener acceso para dar las recomendaciones pertinentes. Por lo demás, también tenemos el compromiso de que 10 eh, relatores especiales puedan visitar Venezuela en, el, en este curso de dos a, próximos años y se está trabajando en un cronograma para quiénes serían esos relatores especiales. Eh, el gobierno de Venezuela ha pedido algunos y hay muchos relatores especiales que han pedido ir a Venezuela, se va a construir ese cronograma y nosotros vamos a ser quienes vamos a garantizar que eso se genere en términos de el nuestro nexo con los eh, relatores especiales. Y por otro lado están todas las recomendaciones que han surgido desde el propio reporte que tendiente a hacerse cargo de distintas problemáticas que nosotros hemos eh, identificado y que permitirían que se pueda avanzar sustantivamente en una mejora de la situación de derecho humano en Venezuela. The same thing? No, oh, no, no. But then... The next ah, the next question in English, of course. Yeah. Okay. Should I ask in English or in Spanish? Then? In English. Okay, so I will uh, ask in English. So I, um, You I, can I, ask in Spanish, but I'm supposed to answer in English for the ones who, okay. who, who don't so, speak Spanish. So I will ask in, in English for, for the others also. So I'm Agnès Pedrero, journalist for Agence France Presse. Um, in fact, I have two quick questions. The first question is, um, all those measures, that uh, recommendation that you are asking uh, the government to do to change, like uh, closing the Fuerzas Especiales, how many time do you give to the government to do all those changes? And uh, some uh, NGOs or uh, maybe countries are asking an international investigation. Uh, they want uh, that uh, the international community should go uh, further. Uh, do you uh, support this idea? Well, the first thing is that there's a lots and lots of lots of recommendations. So we, when they're not with deadline, uh, the idea is to continue working and cooperating and working with the government on the field and on the relationship through, through the office here in headquarters uh, to try to uh, uh, encourage them to fulfill those recommendations. We don't put a deadline, we work on that. And we identify also because we need to think, it's, it's like the UPR, when you work on a UPR and you give recommendations, governments accept a number of them and some others not. So we need to, we're not yet in that because we just released the, the report and the recommendations. So we will have to continue working with the government to see which one they're more open to accept, which one we can continue uh, discussing with them, how important it is uh, to, to, to be able to develop those recommendations and implement it. So that's the thing. And in terms of the Commission of Inquiry, uh, we are now in a different situation when the other two reports of the past. We had a report in 2016 and a report in 2017. There was no access to the office. There has never been, I mean, there has never been a presence in the country. Uh, it was only through the regional office, but for many years, for four, five years, we didn't have any access at all. So now we're in a completely different situation. We have two colleagues there permanently working with the technical cooperation, but also monitoring, relating with civil society, etc. So we believe we need to give them some time and some space to this new reality and, 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 const and build the relationship with all stakeholders directly there on the ground. So we believe this is the time for this process. I mean, and I think this is what we should prioritize now because this is a new, completely new scenario and we need to, to, do, to do this, to give this, to give this, how could I say, we see this as an opportunity and we, we need to give them a chance, this opportunity a chance. I don't know why my English today is awful, so but anyway, I'll, uh, it looks like I'm very tired maybe. Madam Bachelet, Jamie from Associated Press. Mm -hmm. you, you, you said that, um, that this is an opportunity, but you heard Mr. Castillo inside. He said that he believes that this report is carrying a biased vision. A, I think the word he used was parcializada. Um, and he also asked for the report to be corrected, I think he said at one point. What do you say to that? Are you going to do that? Well. Since I arrived to the office, I've always asked my colleagues that every fact 
is verified, that we can really be sure that we're not biased, that we're neutral, that we're impartial. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, if there's something that the report does not represent adequately because there was this complaint from the, some NGOs that the situation that I did lift in the ground, that is the relationship with the victims of the Chavismos by the opposition, and I really met this woman whose son was burned and killed alive, burned alive. And I met the policeman, I mean the mother of the policeman who was um, cut his throat because he went into, to, to, to um, how could I say that, to, to see the problem that was in a gas station that the people who were in the demonstration were putting fire on it. I met the man who lost her, her arm due to a um, Molotov uh, bomb. So I met victims from both sides. Huh? But there's something that probably is need to be, and we'll put a little uh, uh, something in the report regarding that, because I truly believe we need to be balanced in the terms of, not balanced in the terms of that, the, that you can say this is the same because states have the main responsibility of ensuring uh, human rights. As a matter of fact, I'm not a lawyer, but you know, in humanitarian law, when it's the state, you speak about human rights violations. When it's not the state, when there are either uh, groups that are from the civil society or armed groups or whatever, you speak about abuses. Because it's, a, it's an international humanitarian human rights law. So even though uh, the, it can be situations that some people could say they were not completely well reflected in the report, and if it's that so, we can look at it or include it in the next report, uh, we always believe that the state is the main responsible for protecting human rights. So if there's something that people can show us that that fact is not adequate, we can always change it, but the truth is that this has been a, a work done by the colleagues for a long time uh, on the ground, interviewing people, interviewing victims, receiving allegations when we were from remote. And so it's not a work done in a week or after the visit. It came from a long time ago. And as I say so, uh, at the end, it could be one person. But if one person is important, that you can change patterns that are not adequate for the total respect and full respect on human rights. But I have to say, independently on the report, when I visited Caracas, I was able to speak with everyone and convey all the messages that I thought represent what is said and the recommendations. Uh, even having been seen the report yet, because it was being prepared at the latest uh, steps, I knew what the things were happening and what I should convey to all of them, to the opposition on one hand, to the authorities on the other. And I do believe that violence is unacceptable. It doesn't matter where it comes from. But states have always more responsibility on this. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes.